Backyard Farmer is a co-production of NET Television and the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension. Tonight on Backyard Farmer, we'll be looking at powdery mildew on lilacs and hear about a homegrown Nebraska business. That's all coming up next, right here on Backyard Farmer. and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for another hour of good gardening. Joining me on the panel tonight, we have experts from the University of Nebraska Extension. Michael Rethwish is here to answer our insect questions. Good evening, Kim. We have Lowell Sandell, all those weed questions. Hi, Kim. Kevin Corris, Rots and Spots. Howdy ho. And Kelly Fian answers all of our landscape questions. Hello, Kim. You know, we'd love to hear from you as well. You can just dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. You can also send us questions or pictures via email. That is byf at unl.edu. We try to answer those questions on a future show. And please do include your location when you send us an email. Also keep in mind, we can't get to everybody's question on the air. So if you do need further assistance, you can always visit with your local extension educator, or you can go to the Backyard Farmer website. As always, we like to start with samples, and Michael, you have one that we've actually been getting quite a few questions about. Oh, well, good. My timing is, is, uh, is appropriate then. What I have here, obviously, are some oaks, or oak leaves, and as we can see, these oak leaves are not looking too good. They've got lots of little stipples and lots of different, um, shall we say, chlorophyll parts out of them and they just don't look healthy. From the top side we don't really know what's happening but when we flip it over that's when we see what's happening here. And what we have here we have uh, the eggs and then we have the immature stages of the oak lace bug and as you can see they do lots and lots of damage uh, but they don't hurt the tree, they may make the leaves kind of turn brown and fall off kind of early. Now, this particular sample also had some aphids on it, and it was kind of interesting when I was out there and looking at things this morning, we found, it looks like a little alligator crawling around. And the alligator actually is the immature stage of a, of a lady beetle. So this little orange black thing is actually gonna turn into a lady beetle, and right now it's giving us some biocontrol uh, of the aphids and probably some of the lace wings as well. So we don't really spray, we just let them be. No, we don't need to spray these. Uh, it looks bad, the trees usually recover, so it's uh, nothing we have to spray for, but it does look, make the trees look bad, that's true. All right, thank you, Michael. Lowell, you have kind of a salad of weeds over there. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to stick to the grass, though. Okay. Um, what we brought in tonight uh, was tumble windmill grass. And this is the seed head uh, in towns and in Lincoln and uh, some urban areas. You'll see these tumbling uh, through the street. And people will uh, confuse this for crabgrass, uh, but the... Um, but tumble windmill grass, the seed head is really more three-dimensional. It has more of a height to it and almost, um, uh, well, uh, just basically a, a, an extra dimension that a crabgrass seed head uh, doesn't have uh, out there. Um, it is a plant that has a very flat uh, stem on, uh, on it uh, as compared to crabgrass, which has a very round stem. And this tends to really lay down uh, close to the ground and um, really tolerate fairly low uh, mowing heights out there. And it has a very uh, kind of lime green or pale green uh, appearance to it. Um, so the big thing about this one and, and crabgrass is this one's a perennial, crabgrass is an annual. So the management strategy is different uh, with these. Um, if you try to do uh, crabgrass control uh, with tumble windmill grass, you're probably not gonna be successful and vice versa uh, on that. So uh, with this, post-emergence applications of tenacity uh, uh, sequentially is probably a fairly good approach to trying to control tumble windmill grass if that's what you have. Excellent, thank you Lowell. All right, Kevin. I have a tomato. 
<laughs> and I have a sick tomato. Uh, it has spots on it. Um, this is a bacterial disease, and I'm going to be honest, I'm not really sure if this is bacterial speck or bacterial spot. I haven't had it in the clinic long enough to figure that out. But uh, for the homeowner, it doesn't really matter um, because the management practices when you do have this or when you think you might have this uh, developing are the same. So it's a bacterial disease, and our bacterial diseases uh, need wound sites or, or wounds on the fruit and on the leaves in order to infect. So um, we had a great year for bacterial diseases because of a lot of the storms and just the weather in general that we had this year. Storms come through, they hail, uh, they bring hail, and they create wounds on the fruits and on the leaves, and these bacteria can get in and infect. So this is either bacterial speck or bacterial spot, and like I said, I'm not really sure. Um, they're caused by two different bacteria, uh, but the management practices are the same. So we want to reduce the amount of uh, injury to the plant. So if the canopy is really, really wet as the fruit is setting, we want to minimize how much we're in the garden, messing with the plants. We don't want to be bumping them around and creating wound sites on the leaves or on the fruits because then they'll develop these little spots. Um, there are some preventative things that we can do. Uh, this is a residue-borne disease, so uh, if you have this at the end of the year, you want to get rid of that residue if you're going to plant tomatoes in there the following year. So get rid of the residue. The residue will overwinter the bacterium. And then there are um, certain preventative sprays that can be used. Uh, Copper-based uh, products can be used to battle both of these bacteria. However, um, there has been some resistance developing in both of these bacteria to copper-based sprays. So it's kind of like darned if you do, darned if you don't. So the best thing to do is just to kind of minimize the damage um, that these tomatoes sustain throughout the growing year and try to keep the foliage and the fruits dry as much as possible. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. And you can cut those out and still eat them, That's right? true. Yep. Yeah, you could probably just skin this thing and the flesh is, is fine. It's a very superficial lesion, so mm -hmm. it's still edible. Kind of, sort of. <laughs> okay, Kelly, you also have tomatoes. Okay. I also have a tomato, and uh, one might think that there's something wrong with these tomatoes, too, but there isn't. These are actually perfectly normal. This is a blueberry cherry tomato, and it's the result of some breeding work that has been taking place. Um, I think it all started at Oregon State University um, when they bred a tomato called Indigo Rose. Uh, and then there's been additional breeding work going on, and this one is, is blueberry. And what, what gives it that, it actually starts out as kind of a, with that blue, it's kind of more of a bluish black, maybe closer to black. Um, how dark it is depends on how much sunlight the tomato receives. Uh, but they start out that uh, bluish black color and then they actually change to red when they're ripe. Um, and the breeding work, uh, like I said, it started there with an indigo rose and now there's been additional breeding work being done to continue to develop more and more um, of these varieties. They have uh, the pigment anthocyanin in it, which is actually uh, very healthy because it provides the antioxidants that everybody likes to get from blueberries. Not quite as much antioxidants as blueberries, but at least more than your average tomato is going to have. And so these are a blueberry cherry tomato. They are an open pollinated um, variety. And so you can buy these, you can save the seed and you can replant them and you should get pretty much the same thing. So they are not a hybrid, they're actually an open, open pollinated one. Great, thanks Kelly. And they do really kind of look like they belong on Kevin's <laughs> side of the table. <laughs> All right, Michael, you get the first picture. This is actually in uh, northeastern Knuckles County. Very dry, at least until initially. These are a bajillion little tiny black bugs on watermelon. They're now, go the leaves are dwarfing and curling, and now they are moving into cucumbers as well. So what is this, and what do they do about it? it I think we have a lot of aphids sucking out lots of plant juices, which is why things are curling. And obviously melons, all types of melons are going to be fair game. It's probably a melon aphid. I can't say that for sure from the picture, but it's possible it's a melon aphid. As far as what they can do, uh, obviously uh, washing things off, soapy water is probably about as good as they have because you don't want to use a lot of pesticides because there are some wasps and, and lady beetles, as we just saw, which will eat aphids. So you want to preserve whatever beneficials we have. All right, good year for aphids, <clears throat> at least initially. Yeah, all right. Lowell, this is, uh, this is definitely not turf. It's right up your weedy alley. Okay. But it's probably a pretty odd question. Our viewers might see something that looks like a vine, and this, this particular person says it is one of the Smilaxes, or okay. briars, 80 acres of it yeah. in the timber. <clears throat> and, and she wants to know how in the world can they get rid of it? And this is the, that's the million dollar question. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, there's not a, 
uh, that I know of a selective spray that they could use to selectively take this out of 80 acres is a is a big big area. Um, so uh, the the briar is a uh, perennial woody um, weedy species with large thorns uh, on the stem, which make it really difficult to handle and control. So they're probably looking at trying, if they have an area that they really want to restore or keep, um, you know, use, I would kind of pick and choose uh, my areas uh, with that. And uh, they can go in and cut, uh, cut the, um, the woody stems and paint on uh, herbicide uh, that might cont contain triclopyr or something like that to be able to control uh, these these woody species uh, out there. So uh, the 80 acres is, is tough. Move. Yeah, that that <laughs> that works as well. Okay, Kevin, uh, tomato night. Mm. And we have a couple of viewers who sent us images. This particular one is from Aurora. She's gotten several tomatoes like this from one plant. One. She's wondering, is it environmental? environmental or viral and if it's viral will it go viral mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah it's difficult to say the fact that it's only on one plant makes me think that yes it is viral so there are several different viral diseases that will cause that kind of mosaic pattern on the fruits um, and then there's a physiological disorder called yellow shoulders um, that can also develop those kind of mosaic -y type patterns since it's only on one plant, I wouldn't think it's a physiological thing. You would think that, that would, uh, if it was something that was you know, inadequate watering or something like that causing the yellow shoulders, you would see it on more than one tomato. So probably a virus. Um, could it spread to the other, others? Um, I, I think it could, but if the fruit's already set, you're not going to see it in the fruit like that. The spread would have to have happened earlier in the season, and the virus would have had to really infect the plant in order for it to show up like that. So it's still probably a good idea to rogue it out. Um, and then I guess the next question people always ask is, can we eat the fruit if it's a viral infected tomato? And I'm never going to suggest that you should. Um, I don't know if it would hurt you or not, but I, I guess I wouldn't. And I don't think the taste would be very great anyway because it doesn't look like there's, you know, had a lot of time for it to, to develop and, and, and to, be, you know, to be a good tasting fruit. So probably a virus and rogue it out is the best cure. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Kelly, this is a viewer that had uh, this plant self-seed itself into their front flower border. Mm -hmm. They want to know what it is, and, and there appears to be a black wasp-like insect that is doing some lovely pollination on it. Kind of wonder, is, is that really what's happening? So No, okay. Well, the plant itself is whorled milkweed, and it's kind of called that because those little long, skinny, linear leaves kind of whorl around the stem. Uh, it's one, one of the characteristic of it that can help you to identify it. You can also break a stem, and if it has milky sap, that'll uh, confirm, too, that it is one of the milkweeds. But it looks like world milkweed. It's a native milkweed. Um, it is considered uh, poisonous, um, ma mainly if, I, I think, if livestock would graze it and so on, although it tastes so bad that usually they don't unless they're not well-fed and so on. So, but world milkweed and, you know, the, the black insect, wasp, or whatever it is. I don't recognize what it is for sure, but I'm sure it's just they're doing some pollinating, unless Michael has an idea. I suspect it's probably just getting some nectar and, and uh, getting what a food source. Excellent. Thanks, gang. Well, for our first feature tonight, we're going to take a look at a Nebraska business that grows trees the right way. But it's not only a good business with University of Nebraska ties, it's a family affair. <music> Here at Great Plains Nursery, we focus on natives. And when we say natives, we uh, mostly mean local provenance natives. So a local seed collected throughout the state, throughout the Midwest, that is gonna prove to do well here in, in Nebraska. Uh, we're very fortunate at Great Plains Nursery. We started this about eight years ago. Uh, my husband and I, Brian, uh, started this and it, it's not just a business to us, it's a lifestyle. So we love growing trees, we love working together, we love working on our farm. And so that was a big part of wanting to start this. Um, and we love rural Nebraska, so we wanted to live out in a rural community where we could raise our family, um, have a business, and work together. Um, so uh, one aspect that we love about what we do is um, that we have our children with us. 
Uh, I think one of the, the biggest things about having them alongside of us is teaching them hard work, teaching them uh, to, once you start something, to follow through with it. A lot of that is uh, when they plant their seeds in the spring, they get to watch them grow all throughout the season. They get to plant their own little trees in the yard every fall, and, uh, and they love watching that grow, and they love that they have to take care of it. And if they miss a couple waterings, oops, there it went. And so it teaches them responsibility and, and commitment and hard work. Fall is a wonderful time to be planting trees. There's many advantages that come with planting smaller trees. Many include easy to handle, um, quicker transplantability, lower cost. Um, one of my favorite sizes to plant is a three to four foot size. This is a three gallon here. Um, and the reason that I like to really plant these is with kids. Kids can very easily take this out and plant it. They can handle it, plant it, and it's fun to be able to watch this take off and grow throughout its life cycle. With running a business here at our home and off of our farm with our family here, it can be a struggle in trying to balance family time and work time and, and stopping the, the work day. That can be a struggle sometimes. But um, for us, we've just decided to take our kids right along with us. So when we do seed collecting, we don't do it during a work day. We do it on the weekends. We do it in the evenings. We take our kids with us and, and let them experience what we're doing. And, and it gives us a deeper relationship. and. It helps us to remember too to just take it day by day and um, just enjoy the moments that we do get with them. Spending time with your children around your garden is really a great way to bond with them and does give a wonderful association with plants, the outdoors, and growing your old, own food. And we want to say thanks to Heather and Brian for doing that and that's probably the next generation of backyard farmers. Yep. All right, you get the next pictures, Michael, and this is a couple of bean people. Uh, green beans themselves have holes in them, as you can see. Can't find the insects, um, and this is kind of a Cambridge area, so you can see the, both the bean and the leaf. And then the second one is uh, beans that were touching the ground, and the insects had just started eating the beans, and she says this is only an hour later. You can see how much damage they've done. Looking at the second picture we have on the screen right now, uh, those are tumble flower beetles. And those are the adults. Uh, they are generally found in uh, uh, immature stages and really high uh, organic soils, uh, that, and those sort of things. The first picture, the hole in leaf looked like it could be bean leaf beetle, mm -hmm. uh, and, but there's a lot of damage for bean leaf beetles that I may or may not think that that's all that's happening here. But I can't dismiss bean leaf beetle. It looks like it's old damage because the, uh, the, it wasn't fresh. It looked, especially in the leaf, you could see it had a uh, brown area around that. Yeah, and we've had quite a few questions about bean leaf beetle this year, so cut them out, eat them, or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have a what in the world is this weed, okay. Lowell, which has apparently crept itself into the edges of the turf uh, uh, from kind of a, a park area adjacent to it, and they're, and they're wondering what it is and how do they control it in their turf. And you just happen to have a piece. I just piece. happen to have the <laughs> same one. Uh, actually, what we're looking at here is common ragweed. Um, this is uh, one of the um, weeds that we're concerned about for allergies and things like this. So it, as much as people can, getting rid of, of common ragweed is, is a really good thing to do everything you can to reduce pollen load uh, in the environment out there. Um, this is one I pulled out of a, a turf uh, right close to campus here. Uh, you can see that uh, it's been surviving about <coughs> a three inch mowing height on this and uh, it just keeps branching from, from lower nodes uh, on this. Uh, tends to come up fairly early uh, in the growing season. Um, it's, it's very susceptible to growth regulator herbicides, 2,4-D and dicamba. Um, it's a little bit of a struggle using those right now for control because of the hot temperatures out there. And this is a summer annual species, so it's probably going to die off uh, fairly soon uh, out here anyway. So um, it will set seed. Those plants will be there next year. Just plan on uh, a 2,4-D or, or a dicamba application earlier in the spring next year. Uh, should take care of them very well. All right. Thank you, Lowell. Kevin, this is a viewer that has a peach. Not, not a peach of a peach, kind of a brown half of a peach. Mm. And he's peeled a portion away on one section also and, and is wondering, is, there, is it a mold? Mm -hmm. They're two to three weeks from ripening. He says about a third of his peaches are doing this. Should he remove them from the tree? And then, of course, 
what does he do next year? He's kind of bitten the yeah. bullet on this year. Yeah, so. you know, there's a, there is a disease of stone fruits and peaches that's called brown rot, but I, I don't think this is brown rot because brown rot would be a little bit more fuzzy, uh, where that looks kind of like a rough, cracked surface, plus brown rot would actually start rotting the, the interior fruit. And as you can see on that second picture, the fruit seemed to be relatively clean. Um, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's any kind of a viral disease. I think it's actually probably just a nutritional or an environmental type of a stress that was put on, on those fruits as they were developing. Um, I don't think other than maybe some kind of a, a fertilizer regime next spring, uh, there's anything that, that could really be done. I, I just, given those pictures and the fact that the fruit, the underlying fruit seem to be unaffected, I don't think it's a disease of any sort. I think it's more of just a, a nutrient deficiency or improper watering or something like that, more of an environmental stress than a disease. But you really want one in the clinic, don't you? Uh, that's a good point, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure, I, I would definitely love to take a look at it in the clinic uh, if uh, send it to 448 Plant Sciences Hall. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kevin. Uh, Kelly, this is uh, a viewer in the North Platte area who has white pine in a beautiful landscape, but says uh, it really loses most of its needles over the, over the winter months. It starts doing this, uh, dead needles on the branches, wondering about what he can do to care for this tree a little bit better and uh, avoid losing it. Okay, well, when you look fairly, you know, at the close-up picture, it appeared to me that the needles that are brown are uniformly brown from the tip of the needle back, and that's what I would, I would go up closely and look at it. And if the needles that are turning brown are, are it's from the tip of the needle back, and like the base of the needle is green, they, that it appeared to be maybe more of a scorch. And that's a and fair, uniform, top down, and you know throughout the tree. I, I could not, when I zoomed in and so on in the picture, I could not see any signs of lesions or anything like that that would indicate possibly a disease. So that would indicate a stress of some sort. And the stress, I was looking at that picture. I don't know if the white pine was planted and then that bed was put in around it, um, or if it was, you know, the bed was put in and then the white pine was planted. But make, if it was the other way, the reverse, the, the tree was there and then they installed that bed and they put in the perennials underneath it and so on. Maybe that created some stress to the roots. Um, I don't know, you know, they want to save it. I realize that, but it's looking, it's looking pretty bad at this point, but to save it, um, you know, just make sure there isn't too deep a mulch over it. Possibly quit digging around it. If you're doing any kind of digging to plant anything or, or divide any perennials, um, put some mulch around, at least maybe six foot around the base of that and no other plants. Make sure it's, the soil's moist but not too wet. And I guess time will tell, but it doesn't look real good. All right, thank you, Kelly. Well, downy mildew in Impatience has been in other parts of the country. We're starting to see it here. So here to tell us more about it for our Green and Growing Tip is Kevin Chorus. Impatience downy mildew is a disease of impatience that's becoming more and more common from season to season. Typical symptoms of impatience downy mildew uh, begin with a yellowing or a stippling of the leaves. Eventually, on the undersides of these leaves, a white cottony mass will develop. This is very indicative of the downy mildew type diseases. These leaves will eventually droop and fall off, leaving nothing but bare stems. If you see this in the landscape, it's a good indication that you have downy mildew. Impatient downy mildew can overwinter in the soil, so it's very difficult to replant impatience into a bed that's already had the disease. The best method for preventing this disease is to select disease-free nursery stock. Inspect all impatience that you buy from the nursery for the yellowing or stippling of the leaves or the cottony mildew on the undersides of the leaves. There are certain types of fungicides that can be applied preventatively to help reduce the amount of disease in the landscape. Uh, look for active ingredients including mancozeb, uh, azoxystrobin, and mephinoxam. It's always a good idea to inspect not only your impatience, but anything else you buy at the garden center for problems like this. And there should be plenty of stock to choose from so you're not bringing that problem home. And I, we actually have been getting quite a few questions just this year about downy mildew and impatience. All right, Michael, um, we have a viewer who has seen some very large, close to an inch long, uh, red ants 
recently and she says she'd love to send a picture but they're fast little boogers and, and they run away. So any idea what they might be? Actually I think what we have from that description may be a velvet ant. And actually that's actually a wingless wasp and they do move very, very fast and they, they kind of agitate like this as they walk. So if it's moving very fast, red, if it's really hairy, it's a velvet ant, which is a type of wasp, not really a, a true ant. Okay, and just enjoy and stay yeah. away. If, if you don't see them very often, at least yeah. I don't. I've seen them before, they're, they're really interesting, but they pack a powerful sting, right. don't they? Yeah. They can, yeah. One, yeah. Of the, one of their name, nicknames is a cow killer. Cow killer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be powerful. All right, <laughs> Lowell, uh, clover questions. So how do you get the clover out of the lawn and is this the time of year to do it? Um, so uh, I assume they're talking about white clover uh, yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, it's a perennial. Um, this is really not the best time of year to, to try and control it. We're kind of in the, the heat of the summer uh, here and doing a lot of broadleaf control. Just, it just isn't you know, the best thing to do uh, this time of year. Um, they're probably looking at uh, sequential apps in the fall and the spring. Um, st starting this fall uh, with an active ingredient or herbicide that contains uh, triclopyr or, uh, and or dicamba uh, there. Um, 2,4-D by itself maybe isn't uh, exactly as effective as something with uh, triclopyr or, or dicamba uh, in it, but if they have a you know, really healthy uh, clover infestation, um, going about it that way. The other thing it might indicate is they might be deficient on nitrogen uh, in, mm -hmm. in their turf. Uh, the clovers will fix nitrogen. Um, so looking at your overall turf management uh, would be beneficial as well. Excellent, thank you. All right, Kevin, we have a viewer who has garden flocks. Uh, several uh, sorts of insect questions associated with it, but she also has stems that are all of a sudden going quite brown and just sort of Wilting. Healing over, yeah. Um, I do believe uh, if there's adequate water and, and you're seeing wilt symptoms, um, it's always a good indication of some kind of a root crown or stem disorder. Um, I believe that phlox is a host of a fungus called verticillium, which can be really nasty in, in the garden because uh, verticillium has a very, very, very large host range. Um, it can infect many, many different kinds of plants. Um, I guess, you know, to be safe, you could submit a plant for testing, um, but uh, the wilting, especially when there's water, is not a good sign, and you might want to remove that plant to, to kind of keep those. Um, if, if it is indeed a fungus, you want to keep that inoculum low, so rogue it out. All right, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Kelly, we've had a couple of people send us pictures and then ask us questions about zucchini that rather mm -hmm. than being smooth, <laughs> look like frog skin, all warty and bumpy. Do we know, have any idea what that might be? Well, well, personally, I have never seen that. So, and I asked Kevin if there was such a thing as a virus maybe on a zucchini that might be warty, and, and uh, typically you might see some discoloration or mosaic in it. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, fall back on the probably environmental um, because I, I, I don't know what would cause that, you know, or, or maybe, you know, maybe, you know, cool the temperatures at night and then warmer. It, sometimes it could just be if, if it gets um, really dry and then it gets really wet. That can cause some odd growth habits with the plants, um, but I, I, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, I guess peel it off, and, and if it looks good underneath, then still enjoy it and eat it. All right, thanks, Kelly. Well, a little bit of rain sure has helped brighten things up out in our garden. Before we go to break, let's take a minute to see what's happening out in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farm or Garden, we've actually gotten a little bit of rain, which is great, and we're anxiously awaiting some more here in Lincoln. Um, the squirrels are still um, anxiously getting all those freshly ripe tomatoes before we get them. We are seeing a little bit of dieback in our melons. Um, we're investigating and thinking we have some squash vine borer within our melons. Our um, echinacea co-flower is really looking great still. Um, we're doing a little bit of deadheading to kind of bring some of that color back. So we're really excited about that great color that's in our garden and looking forward to extending that well into the fall season. And we're also looking at 
um, harvesting some of our dill. Our dill is getting ready and cucumbers are getting ready. So we're looking at harvesting some of that dill and making some pickles out of the cucumbers and the dill. And that's what's happening in the backyard farmer garden. Time for a short break. Coming up, we'll have the plant of the week in the lightning round. Stay tuned for more Backyard Farmer right after this. Thanks for staying with us on Backyard Farmer. Later on in the show, we're gonna hear from Lauren about powdery mildew and lilacs. We'll see Gladys's plant of the week. You can still phone in your questions by dialing 1-800-676-5446. While you're doing that, we'll start the lightning round and give a shout out to our viewers who sent us those gorgeous break pictures. Mm -hmm. All right, Kelly, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> can a viewer split little blue stem? And if so, when should that happen? Yes, you can do that, and I would, I would do it in the spring. Okay. Is there anything besides liquid iron that can help keep a very chlorotic river birch green? Uh, <laughs> well, you, you could try a, a trunk injection if it's, it's large enough that's still liquid. Um, and there are some, spi not spikes, but there are some ferrous sulfate and powder and so on that you could put into the soil. Okay, we have a Council Bluffs viewer who would like to know whether they can divide a bleeding heart, and if so, when? No, don't divide it. It'll kill it. <laughs> okay, uh, a viewer lost an old silver maple and wants to replace with a shade tree. Any suggestions? Okay, lots of wonderful shade trees. The oaks, um, there's some new hybrid elms, ginkgos, Kentucky coffee tree. There, there's a nice long list. Excellent. Will a stump sucker off of an old red bud grow into a tree and flower? And this is in the South Sioux area. It, they can grow into a nice new tree um, if, you, if you give it some tender loving care. Excellent, nice job. Ready, Kevin? I am ready to bring the thunder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a viewer who wants to know whether tomatoes with bacterial speck can be eaten. Um, probably if you peel off the flesh, the, the, the skin on the outside. Excellent. Will Epsom salts help prevent blossom end rot in tomatoes? Ooh, I doubt it. Uh, unless they contain cal uh, calcium, it sounds like if adding a salt to the soil would make uh, it a kind of a sodic soil harder for it to take up water, which would uh, increase the amount of blossom end rot. So no. Okay. I what does do it that. cost to have something diagnosed in your diet? Fifteen dollars, unless there's a special <laughs> test that needs to be run, and then you're looking at maybe twenty-five. But I'll talk to you before I charge you that extra ten dollars. <laughs> Excellent. A carny viewer wants to know why they don't have any flowers or fruit after spraying their hawthorns for rust. Uh, it's probably not the spray. Ooh, I'd like to phone a friend and see if a uh, hawthorn needs a male, a female type of a thing. It's not. It's perfect flower. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, it shouldn't be the spray, though. Okay. Is, uh, do you use sulfur or copper-based products for black spot? Are those recommended? E, uh, yes. Both would be fine. For, like black spot of rose? Yes. All right. Will new roses contract rose rosette if they're planted in the same hole? No. Nice job. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, you ready weed guy? Yes. Okay. Um, this, this viewer used burlap over their bluegrass uh, several months ago, and they wonder how long it's going to take it to decompose. I don't think de burlap decomposes very well, so a long time. You All probably right. want to get rid of it. All right. Uh, is there anything that will control nut sedge right now? And then their follow-up question is forever. Uh, not forever. Uh, here uh, this time of year, you can use uh, either sedge hammer or dismiss. Uh, sulfentrazone is the active ingredient. It will it'll burn off the foliage, uh, so it'll be okay or not be there this fall. Uh, but that's that's it'll be back next year. All right. What is the product to use and the timing for controlling wild violets? Wild violets, if you uh, have a product that contains triclopyr and in the fall and then a repeat application in the spring if necessary. All right, when do we aerate and overseed, and this is in the Columbus area? Uh, it's about time to start aerating. Uh, here, first of September, uh, a couple weeks would be uh, uh, ideal time. All right, should something go in the sidewalk cracks between the lawn and the curb if they've stretched away? So, more soil. Sure. More, more soil. <laughs> yeah. <Perfect. laughs> Here you go. Sometimes the answers are pretty simple. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, all right, are you ready, Michael? We'll find out, I guess. <laughs> uh, we have a viewer who wants to know whether she should replace the soil in her containers every year to help get rid of her aphid infestation. You can get rid of the soil, but the aphids are not there, so no and yes. <laughs> all right. So are, the, are those beans with the brown spots from the bean beetles safe to eat? They should be if, you're, if they're cooked. All right. Can you buy leafy spurge hawk moths anywhere to control um, leafy spurge? Not to my knowledge. All right. Can seven dust or carbaryl be applied to the stems after flowering to prevent squash vine borers? At this point in time, we're too late in the year for squash vine borers. Uh, that needed to be done a month ago already. All right. Do monarchs lay their eggs here? Actually, they lay them on milkweeds, but not necessarily here in the, in the audience. I mean, in the studio, but, <laughs> but uh, um, milkweeds in Nebraska, yes. Okay. Will controlling the grubs in the lawn control Japanese beetles? If, the, if they are there, it would, because the grubs of Japanese beetles are white grubs as well. All right, excellent. Nice job. Kelly, plant of the week from Gladys, oh, that's please. That's right. Mm -hmm. So nice <clears throat> job, all. You guys are kind of getting the hang of this. Finally. Finally, the season's <laughs> almost over. <laughs> okay. All right, what she brought us? She Kelly. brought us, let's see, which side is prettier? I think this side is prettier. Um, she brought us a star. The white one in the middle is Star of Bethlehem. And that is a non-hardy plant to Nebraska. Um, hers is a very tall one. She says it gets up to about five feet tall. And it, the flowers kind of open from continuously for weeks from the bottom up. You can see it's kind of open on the bottom and then there's still some buds up here yet to open. Um, it, it, it is not a hardy one, it is a bulb. So uh, Gladys brings it in over the winter and she kind of stores it in, in verticillium, or not verticillium, <laughs> I've been listening to Kevin too long, vermiculite, uh, vermiculite in kind of a non-heated basement. Um, so it's kind of a, a, this one's a very tall one, I think she said about five feet tall, um, but she doesn't give the variety on it or the cultivar. The red ones on the side are an annual, um, they're one of our annuals, they are a salvia, and these get, oh, they like full sun. They get about 18 inches tall. Um, and like most annuals, they'll bloom up until frost. So a nice vivid red flower. And it's a nice combination there. So thank you to Gladys. And she must be getting ready for Go Big Red football season. Yes, that's right. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, as always, to Gladys. All right, Michael, you get the next picture question. Okay. Um, we do not know where this viewer is from but has grape vines and found this interesting thing on the vines and, and is wondering what it is. Those are galls and actually what is, the, the insect inside of it is a little small midge. Um, it's not gonna be detrimental to the plant, it makes it look funny, but that's what we have happening here. It's a, it's a little gall uh, caused by a very small fly-like insect called a midge. Okay, and he could pluck that off if there's only one of them, right? Just if, if, you, don't, if you don't break the stem. Okay, yes. all right, excellent. Um, okay, Lowell, we have, we have a handful of people <clears throat> asking about this weed-like thing coming up in either their landscape or not. Okay. And what do we think this is? It appears to be common pokeweed. You can tell by the uh, flower uh, right there. Mm -hmm. um, that is, it, you know, it's kind of big and fleshy, and sometimes it, it looks like it might supposed to be in a garden or landscape, but it's not. It's a weed, and it's actually one you probably want to get rid of. Uh, it is. Uh, it can be poisonous, or the berries can. Uh, uh, out there so I, I would go ahead and, and pull that up uh, it is a perennial uh, make sure that you uh, pull up the root if it comes back uh, next spring apply some glyphosate uh, or uh, and or 2,4-D to that to control it and that one can get the size of a small child <laughs> yes it can it can have a very large stem uh, late in the year all right thank you Lowell all right, this is a Rots and Spots question. This is a Lincoln viewer, Kevin. I uh, saw a tree in their neighborhood that they thought was in flower, but then realized it's too late, and then got up closer and then saw this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, those are, uh, those are the acial horns, as they call them, of a fungus mm -hmm. called cedar hawthorn rust. Um, so as the name implies, this fungus requires two hosts to complete its life cycle, a cedar tree, in a hawthorn tree. So what we're seeing is the hawthorn side. And those infections occur kind of uh, late spring into early summer and you'll see that into the fall. 
Um, and then you'll see the, the cedar side or the juniper side of the disease in the early spring. So if you've ever seen a juniper tree or a cedar tree with the, what looks like a pine cone on it, um, and then in the spring when it gets warm and it's uh, considerably a lot, or when we get enough rainfall, it looks like the pine cone sneezes without a Kleenex. You, know, you get those orange, nasty, hangy down things. Those are called the teleal horns. So when you see that, that's a great uh, uh, indication that uh, the spores are on the move. So that's when we would want to start applying uh, any kind of a preventative spray treatment um, to our hawthorn trees. Um, and what you would want to look for is a product containing a propiconazole type of uh, active ingredient. And you can get some, some decent protective uh, type of, um, well, you can get some protection from this disease uh, if it's applied when you see those nasty orange things on, on the cedar trees. So cedar hawthorn, it's also cedar apple rust too. You can, you can get the same kind of thing on your apple trees as well. So not a lot you can do other than this preventative sprays. And even if you don't have cedar trees close, uh, it can be miles away and you can still get this on your hawthorn, unfortunately. Excellent, thank you, Kevin. All right, uh, Kelly, we have a viewer with two different eggplants. Uh, one's purple and one is not. She said they're green and sort of odd shaped and wonders are there varieties of eggplant that are not purple? Yes, there are. There, there are green varieties, there are white varieties, there's purple streaked ones. Um, so most likely um, this is one of, one of the green varieties. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the names. I think there's one called apple green. Um, there's one called Jade Sweet. There's some Asian types that are green as well. So uh, chances are that's, that's what she got. She got just a little, something a little bit different and has a nice green eggplant. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Well, we heard from Kevin earlier in the show about downy mildew on impatience. And right now, Lauren is going to show us powdery mildew on lilacs. Once we get into that mid-July and later time period, we can start seeing powdery mildew in a lot of our lilac plantings. Uh, when we're looking inside that canopy, it's always gonna start really deeper in the canopy where it's shaded. This is a disease that really likes shaded conditions. So a lot, just like you see powdery mildew in your lawns, uh, many times even late spring, in that area behind the house or somewhere where you have lots of shade under a big tree, that's the same with powdery mildew on lilac. We'll see this usually in those shaded areas first and then it'll start coming out. And once those light level conditions start dropping when we get past that summer solstice time, then we start getting into fall when we get lower levels of light. Again, that's a time period when we start seeing more mildew. So many times, uh, you know, many of our viewers will, will have a lilac bush that may be completely covered with this powdery type dusty appearance like we see on this one, or where it looks like you almost took baby powder and just sprinkled it over the bush. Now, as far as damage and control on something like this, powdery mildew is not a disease that's really gonna kill the lilac bush, for example. It's gonna be fine. Uh, it's just really gonna be an aesthetic thing. So some things you can do culturally to try to manage powdery mildew, we can do some overhead irrigations. This is one time I'll tell you to water overhead. As mildews, and a lot of times with our powdery mildews, they don't like to be wet and, and pure wet like many of our other fungal diseases do. So just simply on a, on a lilac bush, redirecting that sprinkler and actually spraying over it can help. And the other thing we can do uh, is look at some canopy thinning uh, as well, just to prune out those areas where we've got a lot of mildew affected. This is a disease too that's gonna overwinter locally, so residue management can be helpful. And then finally, uh, as a last option, you could look at fungicides, but really, I, I don't really recommend a fungicide for powdery mildew on lilac. Uh, because in general it's not that severe. Maybe if you've got a younger shrub that you're a bush that you're planting uh, that you're just getting established and you see in this problem if it's a real heavy older landscape where it's under a tree and you see a lot of it at an early stage you might look at control but in general if we've got a large planting like we have here and we have some powdery mildew coming in at the lower portion of the canopy we really don't need to worry too much about managing that problem. So really just uh, try to to do what you can with sanitation, do what you can with that overhead irrigation. Those would be my main management uh, points for powdery mildew and look forward to those flowers next spring. So this is one of those few times that using an overhead sprinkler really does help. And as Lauren said, if things really get bad, you could use a fungicide application. I know he's not really a proponent of doing much fungicide stuff. All right, Michael, uh, fourth question for you of the evening. This is a viewer at Fort Calhoun. 
she has these holes uh, in, in the barn. So in the, in the soil around the barn, they're in really lo loose soil. Whatever it is digs around in circles, but she can't find whatever it is. She has to go to the bottom of the hole. <laughs> uh, what we have down there at the bottom of the hole is, is the larval stage of an antlion. Hmm. And the antlion has uh, sickle-like jaws. It throws up uh, lots of, of uh, dust uh, around the hole, tries to have ants come down, grabs the ant with the sickles, uh, mandibles, and sucks them dry, kicks them back out, and reforms the hole. Some kids like to take a, a piece of string and go fishing for the immature, some people call them doodle bugs. Oh, for <laughs> heaven's sakes. That's kind of fun. All right, uh, Lowell, you had a little ragweed. Okay. So I think you now have a picture of the big one, although it hasn't started quite ragging yet. Is uh, that what that is? Yep, that's what it is. That's a uh, giant ragweed. You can see the three-lobed uh, leaf there. It's a summer annual species. It actually uh, emerges very early uh, in the growing season. Uh, so right now, if there's not too many of them, if they can just pull them up or if they use a weed eater or something like that, uh, get rid of them before it starts shedding pollen because, again, this is one of the species that causes hay fever and, and allergies and, and stuff like that. Um, again, uh, like common ragweed, giant ragweed is very susceptible to growth, reg growth regulator herbicides early in the growing season. Um, so uh, if it's there, it probably has seed in the seed bank. It will be there again next year. Plan on application of 2,4-D early in the growing season to get rid of them. All right, thank you. Uh, Kevin, we have a, a viewer that has raspberries that are looking like that. So they have kind of these stems and these wilty things going on. Um, they, he did say one got hail damage, uh, the other was protected from the hail and doesn't seem to look like this. So wondering perhaps what this is and, and is there anything he can do to prevent it next year? Yeah, um, it's, it's likely the result of the hail um, and it could just be damage leading to a cane that died out because of the damage. Um, but uh, sometimes when we do have wounds in those canes like that, you can, uh, those, those canes become susceptible to like anthracnose type of, of diseases. Um, so it's hard to say just from that picture whether or not there's a disease there. The canes definitely died out probably as a result of the hail damage. Um, so if it's just that and it's just physical wounding causing the cane to die back, then uh, I wouldn't worry about management recommendations for the following year. But if it is a fungus and you might need to submit a sample in order to tell that, if it is a fungus, then there are some things that we want to worry about, residue management, pruning out those canes that are, that are infected um, so that it doesn't come back next year. So it um, might possibly want to send in a sample, but either way, you should probably remove the dead, the dead canes. All right, thank you, Kevin. Kelly, this is a uh, Sioux City viewer who has a, a big old juniper, <laughs> over 30 years old, and has started to do this and is getting progressively worse. Okay, well, it doesn't look good, obviously, <laughs> I don't have to say that. And, you know, I don't, looking at it uh, in the picture, it's hard to say whether this could have been some winter injury or maybe there's some cercospora going on in there. I don't know if Kevin agrees or not. But at any rate, um, you know, what's brown is brown and will not green up again. So you need to look at that and you need to decide. You, you, there is quite a bit of green left, but anytime you go in there and prune out that brown and you're, you're pruning back beyond where there's any green, it's not going to regenerate some new growth and cover up those bare areas. So once you remove that brown, uh, dead brown material, it may not look very aesthetic again. And if, if you know, I guess as a homeowner, you have to make that decision. Uh, do you want to re retain it or do you want to cut it off right at the base? So it's kind of up to the homeowner and, you know, I don't know if they decide to keep it. I don't know, do you think it'd be beneficial, Kevin, uh, uh, to apply a fungicide for some I, I really don't. Um, I, it's been a nasty year, a uh, nasty few years for our cedars and our juniper trees. I get a lot of them into the clinic and I've looked at a lot of them from the Midwest, or mostly from Nebraska, I guess, but uh, I haven't seen a lot of fungal issues. A lot of it's just been drought stress, winter injury type stuff. So. All right, thanks guys. Well, we have a couple of announcements of things in the gardening world that actually involve us. So we're gonna toot our own horn and that of NET. Open house August 16th, nine to noon, right here at uh, the studio, behind the scenes tours. And I hear a suspicion that some of us are gonna be there as well. We're also going to the fair. So we will be at the fair on the 27th at the Nebraska building at 1.30, answering all those questions or passing and eating fried things on a stick.
<laughs> All right, you get a question, Michael. This is a West Point viewer who uh, thinks they haven't heard the cicadas this year. Okay. The cicada, and that may be very accurate. The cicada numbers have been way down this year. We heard a few of them in the last week of July. Mm -hmm. There's been very, very few in numbers. Uh, so a couple of thoughts of that is the very dry last fall, mm -hmm. and when they hatched out from the trees and fell down, the, they just kind of dried out. The other question is, it was so cold and so uh, this winter with lack of snow cover, hmm. and what did that do? We don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of sad. They're, they're kind of nice. <laughs> All right, uh, we have an Omaha viewer, Lowell, that wants to know about Bella Bluegrass. And they want to know, is it really something that we, uh, we recommend, and is it really only three inches tall, kind of forever? Well, I, no, we don't. Uh, the, the Bell Bluegrass, I think part of the um, appeal of that was uh, low maintenance, uh, slow growing, um, uh, and you know, a lack of really putting a lot of effort uh, uh, into managing that and still maintaining a good lawn. Uh, but I, I know on campus we had some problems with the bluegrass that, that we tried to uh, establish uh, on there. So we typically don't recommend that. There are uh, better improved cultivars of uh, Kentucky bluegrass or turf type tall fescue that would probably work better. All right, thank you, Lowell. Kevin, uh, we, we're having quite a few questions about diseases in turf or more importantly, Seeded six weeks ago, for example, this is a Lincoln uh, viewer, new grass seedlings, and now they're sort of thinning and looking fungal. Mm. Um, are we kind of too late to do anything, or what, what happens with those kinds of things it right now? It could be just transplant, or, or they're new seedlings, and mm -hmm. it, you really shouldn't seed at that time of the year. It's kind of hot and dry, so we could have a little problem with that. Um, but there are some brown patch, summer patch types of diseases going on. Um, but unfortunately, we've missed the opportunity to, uh, right now, you've missed the opportunity to apply any kind of a fungicide or anything like that. So we're beyond that. At this point, we just um, kind of have to work on filling in those areas um, either this fall or, or next spring. I, I would defer to Lowell on when the best time to kind of re reseed or, or, or whatever. Uh, we're, we're, um we're coming up on that right now. Uh, in, in about the next two weeks, uh, folks are really wanting to reseed. It's time to do it. Right. Uh, give the plants enough time here uh, in the fall to really get established, get growing. All right, excellent. Kelly, uh, lots of hydrangea questions mm -hmm. this year. This is one who says she has endless summer and they really haven't flowered well. Um, leaves are big, green, no flowers. They do cut the plants down to eight inches every single year. And, and they're in the shade, they get plenty of water. Why are they not flowering, probably? Okay, well, this is a common question that I've been getting about uh, hydrangeas this year, and especially endless summer. And it, you know, if it's, if it's well-established plant, it may be that it was injured this past winter with, all, again, the cold, open winter that we had. And I guess, you know, give it, hopefully next year, the year after, it'll bloom again. So as long as it looks healthy, I wouldn't do change my, uh, what I'm doing with it. If it's a fairly young one, you know, realize that um, it takes a couple of years sometimes for these uh, to get established enough that they are going to start blooming and blooming really well. So sometimes it could just be age. Um, it's a woody plant and they need a little maturity on them to bloom well. You know, the endless summer ones are the ones that bloom on, you know, old wood as well as current year's wood, um, but they still bloom best when the plant gets a little bit more mature. So and I guess I, as long as it's green and it's healthy, and, and it's a, this is a common question that we're getting this year, that endless summer is not blooming. So we're kind of chalking it up to winter as long as you're pruning correctly. And, you know, I wouldn't prune it down to the ground every single year. Right. Uh, and and that's, I think that's what a lot of people do and I would maybe stop pruning it to the ground every single year and see if that helps as well. All right, thanks, Kelly. Michael, another what happened to it question. Okay. Where are the daddy long legs? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen any either, but uh, yeah. um, it, the cold winter last year has caused some problems. Uh, that could be related to that. It could be food source. I, I don't know the answer to what has caused the, uh, shall we say, the lack of sightings. All right, thanks. We have a Republican City uh, viewer, Lowell, who has new sod. It's 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 sod, okay. and it has foxtail coming up through it, or in it, 
They're okay. wondering, is it through it, in it, under it? How, how could that have happened? Yeah, if, it, if it's new sod, I, that's, uh, I, I don't know how it got maybe in, in the pieces. Maybe it's coming up between uh, the, the joints uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the layers of, of sod there. Um, regardless, if you just keep it mowed off uh, here this year, try and prevent seed production, uh, that will help. Next year, uh, the same things that are uh, decent on crabgrass control pre-emergence are also uh, decent on foxtail uh, control. So if they're uh, put a pre-emergence down, it should really help with, uh, with uh, uh, foxtail. Okay, and, and I suspect that that would be something that would kind of be a little nerve-wracking for someone who has just put new, new sod. New, new sod down, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for Backyard Farmer. We want to say thanks to our panel for another great show and to everybody who submitted questions and pictures. Helping us on the phones tonight, we had Master Gardeners Gladys Juring, George Edgar, Bertine Loop, John Cariato, and UNL Extension Horticulture Assistant Terry James. From Finky Gardens was Lou Ann Finky. Next time on Backyard Farmer, we're going to be focusing on materials for your hardscape areas around your home. We'll hear about the differences between modern permeable pavers and traditional flagstone. Thanks for watching, good night, good gardening, and we'll see you all next week right here on Backyard Farmer.